Hello, my name's Roisin, and I'm excited about some books, obviously. Hello friends, and welcome to my channel. If you are new here, welcome back if you've been here before. Uh, I am not feeling my best today, which is why I'm coming to you from my bed, and I am wearing my jammies. I changed it to like slightly fancier jammies so that um, it wouldn't be quite so obvious, but then I just told you about it anyway, so. <laughs> anyway, in today's video, I wanted to talk to you about some books that I am excited about, some books that I have heard about recently. They've recently come across my radar in some way, and I have become interested and want to read them, but they are not new releases. So I often talk about books that are coming out that I'm excited about. I've got a whole playlist of those that you can check out in the cards above if you are interested. But I also discover books that are new to me that I've never heard of before from various different places, including other booktubers, bookstagram, or just working in a library um, and my tendency to scroll through my library catalogue when there are not many people there. So I thought since these books are not new and not super hyped, I don't think most of them are anyway, um, I thought it would be good to bring some attention to some books that I'm excited for and want to read in the future um, but haven't talked about before on my channel. And I will also tell you where I found all of my inspiration um, and I will link everyone in the description below all their booktubes and bookstagrams if you want to go and check them out. These people recommend books and I really uh, trust their taste. I'm interested in things that uh, that they talk about, like the way they talk about things, and it makes me want to read the books. So I've got 15 books here. So the first one is Good Talk, Memoir in Conversations by Mira Jacob. And I think I heard about this from Mercedes from Mercy's Bookish Musings. And this is a book inspired by a viral BuzzFeed post, 37 Difficult Questions from My Mixed Race Son, where Mira Jacob responds to her son Zakia, who asked if the new president President Trump hates brown boys like him. Uncomfortable relationship advice from her parents who came to the United States from India one month into their arranged ma marriage and increasingly fraught exchanges with her Trump supporting in-laws. Jacob also investigates her own past including how it felt to be a brown skin New Yorker on 9-11. As earnest and moving as they are, laugh out loud funny, these are stories that have shaped one life but will resonate with many others. I want to read more memoir and I feel like this because it will be broken up into short, these short sections, these is a memoir in conversations, it'll be an easy way to approach memoir uh, and also I know that Mercedes reads a, a fair amount of memoir so I, I trust her um, recommendations when it comes to that sort of thing so I'm hoping to read this one soon. Next on my list is Hood Feminism, Notes from the Women That White Feminism Forgot. And I feel like this is one of the more hyped books, or at least I've heard about it from several people. Um, so I think I first heard about it from Kayla from Books and Lala. I'm very interested to read this as someone who has read a fair amount of feminism texts, but I feel like this is going to be very modern, up to date, and also um, from a non-white perspective. I have read Audre Lorde and Angela Davis, but those are older feminists, so I want to read this as it's um, very up to date as well as being from a non-white perspective. Um, all too often the focus of mainstream feminism is not on basic survival for the many, but on increasing privilege for the few. Meeting basic needs is a feminist issue. Food insecurity, the living wage and access to issues and access to education are feminist issues. The fight against racism, ableism, and transmisogyny are all feminist issues. White feminists often fail to see how race, class, sexual orientation, and disability intersect gender. How can feminists stand in solidarity as a movement when there is a distinct likelihood that some women are oppressing others? From what I've heard from people who have read this, it is incredibly insightful um, and, and is um, an instigation to change and, and a map of how to change in some ways. And I know that Kayla from Books and Lala said that it uh, taught her new things and she learned new things, which is what I normally want from my nonfiction. I want to learn from my nonfiction. It's not just about enjoying it. Um, and I think that this is going to be a really good book from all accounts. Next on my list is Mouthful of Birds by Samantha Schweblin. And I think what initially attracted me to this one was just the beautiful cover. It is absolutely stunning. Um, so that's what made me read the synopsis. And then I was like, oh yeah, definitely I want to read this one. And this is also a collection of short stories and in translation, which are two of my goals for this year. So it fits with a lot of reasons for me wanting to read this. The crunch of a bird's wing, a cloud of butterflies so beautiful it smothers, a crimson flash of blood across an artist's canvas, spine tingling and unexpected, unearthly and strange, the stories of mouthful of birds are impossible to forget. Samata, Samantha Schweblin's writing expertly blurs the line between the surreal and the everyday, pulling the reader into a world that is at once nightmarish and beautiful, an, exhil an exhilarating tour de force to leave 
guaranteed to leave the pulse racing. It sounds like it's going to be incredibly beautiful and poetic writing and also have a touch of fabulism in it, which I love, especially in short stories. Next on my list is The Mountains Sing by a Wen Fan K Mai, which I think I first saw on Simon Hazel's uh, bookstagram page, which is called Footnotes and Tangents. And again, we'll leave that in the description. Um, and he was just raving about this book. Um, I love the way he writes reviews. Definitely check him out if you're at all interested. Um, um, as some, as I, um, I visited Vietnam uh, in 2018 and I absolutely loved it. It is a beautiful, amazing country um, and I definitely want to read more fiction from it, but I've not had the best luck as I uh, didn't like Viet Thanh Nguyen's The Sympathizer. Um, I found that one <laughs> had a lot of difficulties with it. So um, I'm excited to read this. It is set in um, conflict. It is about the Vietnam War. Um, one family, two generations of women and a war that will change lives forever. Hanoi, 1972. As war breaks out in Vietnam, 12-year-old Huang clings to her grandmother in an impoverished shelter as American bombs fall around them. For her grandmother, the experience is horribly familiar. This is a woman who knows what it takes to hold a family together as a country crumbles. And now, coming of age in a nation rocked by conflict, Huang must do the same. So this is a multi-generational story of the Tran family and their experience, and it is described as intimate, lyrical, and bursting with life. Um, so I really enjoy historical fiction. I want to read more about um, Vietnam. And also, as this is written by a woman, I hope it won't have the same problems that I experienced with The Sympathizer. Another one that I saw first, I believe, on Simon Hazel's bookstagram is Bangkok Wakes to Rain, um, which sounds absolutely beautiful. I also visited Thailand in 2018, and this one has like been nominated for prizes, it's been blurbed by so many different people, and I think it's going to be incredibly beautiful and literary. And it is an intricately plotted novel where characters and stories are linked by place, not time. As the novel builds to a futuristic crescendo, moments of intimacy serve to remind us that no matter what the ebb of time may change, we humans persevere. The stories a house can contain, from Bangkok's colonial past to its antediluvian future. This is a bold and tender novel about the unforgivable and unforgiven, and how to live past what you thought you could survive. I have no idea what the plot is, but everyone has been raving about the voice and the beauty of the writing, and I'm really intrigued to read this one. I don't think I mentioned, but it's by Pichaya Sabanthad. Next is one, again, that I think is a bit more well-known, and that is Belonging by Umi Sinha. This is another one where I think the beautiful cover was what first drew me to it. It is absolutely stunning, um, and this one is set in India. And this is about Lily Langdon, who is 12 years old when she witnesses a family tragedy after her mother unveils her father's surprise birthday present, a tragedy that ends her childhood in India and precipitates a new life in Sussex with her great-aunt Wilhelmina. From the darkest days of the British Raj through the aftermath of the First World War, Belonging by Umi Sinha tells the interwoven story of three generations and their struggles to understand and free themselves from a troubled history steeped in colonial violence. As I've mentioned before, um, I am quite interested in World War books, World War One and Two books that are told from non-European or American perspectives. Um, it's a period of history that is called a World War for a reason, but we often only read from specific perspectives here in the UK, and um, I am interested to understand that period of history in a different way than the one that is presented by our school system um, and this one is a book that has been described as incredibly beautiful and moving and a delicate and sensitive unweaving of this um, complex plot which sounds right up my street. Next another one that I believe I first saw on Books and Lala's channel and that is Boat People by Sharon Bala. When a rusty cargo ship carrying Mahindan and 500 fellow refugees from Sri Lanka's bloody civil war reaches Vancouver's shores, the young father thinks he and his six-year-old son can finally start a new life. Instead, the group is thrown into a detention processing centre, with government officials and news headlines speculating that among the boat people are members of a separatist militant organisation responsible for countless suicide attacks attacks, and that these terrorists now pose a threat to Canada's national security. As the refugees become subject to heavy interrogation, Mahindan begins to fear that a desperate act taken in Sri Lanka to fund their escape may now jeopardise his and his son's chance of asylum. I want to read more narratives about um, asylum and 
uh, immigration. I read Amnesty by Aravind Adiga, which was also about a Sri Lankan uh, asylum seeker, although he uh, was an undocumented immigrant because they didn't accept his reasons for being an asylum seeker. Um, I feel like it's really important to read about uh, both non-fiction and fiction, um, but I've heard so many good things about this novel and the beauty of the writing and how poignant and moving it is, and that is why I want to read it. Next one, that is um, kind of nature writing slash travel writing that I'm really not sure how I first came across but which just sounds so brilliant and that is The Frozen River Seeking Silence in the Himalaya by James Crowden. So in 1976 James Crowden left his career in the British Army and travelled to Ladakh in the northern Himalaya, one of the most remote parts of the world. The Frozen River is an extraordinary account of the time he spent there living alongside the Zangskari people before the arrival of roads and mass tourism. James immersed himself in the Zangskari way of life, where meditation and week-long mountain festivals go hand in hand, and silence and solitude are the hallmarks of his existence. When butter traders invite James on their journey down the frozen river lay, he soon realises that this way of living, unchanged for centuries, comes with a very human cross. In lyrical prose, James captures a crucial moment in time for the Himalayan community, a moment in which their Buddhist practices and traditions are in flux, and the economic pull of the world beyond their valley is difficult to ignore. I've heard that this is so beautiful and lyrically written, as the uh, blurb mentions, and also that it is really sensitive to um, the culture with which James is living, um, and um, it is very much about humanity and the slowness and the silence and the movement, and um, it sounds like the sort of travel writing that I find personally really interesting and intriguing, so um, I definitely want to read that one soon. Next on my list is That Reminds Me by Derek Owosu, which Becky Reads Books on Bookstagram has been absolutely raving about for the past year. And so I really, really want to read it, especially when it came into the library. And it's really, really short. And I am really interested in reading more novellas and shorter fiction because it's not something that I've explored a lot. Um, and But this is a really, really short book that is about the care system in Britain, which again is a topic that I feel like I re want to read more about. Um, this is the story of Kay. Kay is sent into care before a year marks his birth. He grows up in fields and woods and he is happy, he thinks. When Kay is 11, the city reclaims him. He returns to an unknown mother and a part-time father, trading the fields for flats and a community that is alien to him. Slowly, if he finds friends. Eventually he finds love, he learns how to navigate the city, but as he grows he begins to realise that he needs more than the city can provide. He is a man made of pieces, pieces that are slowly breaking apart. So it um, explores addiction and mental health and the British care system and racism inside the British care system in all in really like lyrical experimental prose as far as I'm aware. Completely original um, I think Becky uh, Becky Reed's books said it was like nothing that she had ever read before and it was her favourite novel and so incredibly moving um, and so I definitely want to read it soon um, and as it's so short I feel like I should be able to fit it in. Next on my list is a book that I actually own that I bought in December and I was drawn to it because it was the Foils book of the year 2020, that's why I picked it up, um, but I have yet to read it and I haven't really heard anyone talking much about it. And that is A Ghost in the Throat by Doreen Negrifa. This again is an incredibly beautiful novel and by an Irish writer, which is something that I want to do more reading of as someone with Irish parents um, and who considers themselves to be Irish, I feel like I need to read more books by Irish writers. And also Doreen Negrifa is a poet and I love of reading uh, prose by poets because I feel like they can do so many beautiful things with language. Sometimes they struggle with structure but I am with um, this being such a, with foils rating this book so highly I feel like that won't be a problem here. This weaves together two stories. In the 1700s an Irish noblewoman on discovering her husband has been murdered drinks handfuls of his blood and composes an extraordinary poem that reaches across the centuries to another poet. In the present day a young woman narrowly avoids tragedy in her own life. On encountering the poem, she becomes obsessed with finding out the rest of the story. As someone who writes poetry myself, I will leave my poetry Instagram in the description if you'd like to go and check out some of my poems. As someone, as I mentioned, who is Irish, um, this mixture of auto-fiction and historical fiction, um, the, written by an Irish poet, it just seems like entirely up my street. So I'm really excited to read that and I feel like even though I haven't read it yet, it's not that hyped as <laughs> I feel like it should be, just because that premise sounds so brilliant. Next on my list is Guest House for Young Widows Among the Women of Isis by Azade Moaveni. And this one I definitely saw on Hannah from Let's Talk About Books' channel. Um, she was talking about this as being um, a really 
different look from the way that British media portrays the girls who go to ISIS uh, or go to Syria, um, the Middle East, to uh, join ISIS. And um, it is a really important piece of journalism where I believe Moaveni interviews women. Um, an intimate, deeply reported account of the women who made a shocking decision to leave their comfortable lives behind and join the Islamic State. In early 2014, the Islamic State clinched its control of Raqqa and Syria. Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, urged Muslims around the world to come and join the Caliphate. Having witnessed the brutal oppression of the Assad regime in Syria, he moved to fight for justice. Thousands of men and women heeded the call. At the heart of this story is a cast of un unforgettable young women who responded. Emma from Germany, Sharmina from Bethnal Green, London, Noor from Tunis. These were women, some still in school, from urban families, some with university degrees and bookshelves filled with novels by Jane Austen and Dan Brown. Many with cosmopolitan dreams of travel and adventure. But instead of finding a land of justice and piety, they found themselves trapped within the most brutal terrorist regime of the 21st century, a world of chaos and upheaval and violence. What is the line between victim and collaborator? How do we judge these women who both suffered and inflicted intense pain? What is the role? What role is there for Muslim women in the West? The Caliphate's OBGYN and its guest house for young widows, where wives of the fallen waited for them to be remarried, to demonstrate the problem called terrorism is a far more complex, political and deeply relatable, relatable one than we generally admit. So um, a lot of the time in the UK, at least, and I guess in the rest of the West, women who travel to be part of the Caliphate in Syria were either considered to be like uh, horrible monsters um, and stripped of their citizenship, like Samina Begum, or they were considered to be like complete victims. Um, and I suppose this book explores the line between that and what actually happened, what it was really like, um, aside from the way that our media portrays and presents it. And um, Hannah from Let's Talk About Books Baby really seemed to enjoy this and talked about um, talking about it with some of her Muslim friends and the way that it portrayed it. And I think. Um, it just sounds really, really interesting, and I would love to read it. Next one that um, I first saw on Claire Fenby's Instagram page, but she has recently made a video about it as well, uh, which I'll leave in the cards. This is The Beaumont, Fashionable Society in Georgian London by Hannah Grieg. Completely different tone from the last book, um, but equally one that I'm really interested in. I, as I've mentioned many times before, I'm interested in learning more about the 18th century um, because it is the period of history we jump from the English Civil War, which uh, ended in 1660, the English Civil War and the Interregnum, which ended in 1660, to the Victorian period, which began in 1837, um, conveniently skipping over the majority of empire building. Um, but it is a period of history that I want to learn more about, and this is specifically about the world's fashion obsessed society in 18th century London. Caricatured for extravagance, vanity, glamour, celebrity, and all too often embroiled in scandal and gossip, 18th century London's fashionable society had a well deserved reputation for frivolity. But to be fashionable in 1700s London meant more than simply being well dressed. Fashion denoted membership of a new type of society, the beau monde, a world where status was no longer determined by coronets and country seats alone, but by the more nebulous qualification of metropolitan fashion. The beau monde leads us on a tour of this exciting new world, from court and parliament to London's parks, pleasure grounds and private homes. Above all, as the story unfolds, we learn that being a fashionable was about far more than simply being modish. By the end of the century, it had become nothing less than the key to power and exclusive and exclusivity in a changed world. And then finally, a piece of fabulous historical fiction, which, as you may know, is one of my favourite things to read ever. And this one I first saw on uh, Kayla from Books and Lala's channel again, and that is The Night Tiger by Yang Si Chu. So a lot of the books that Kayla recommends I have no interest in because she reads a lot of like thrillers and horror stuff that I don't care about. But this one sounded brilliant. In 1930s colonial Malaya, a dissolute British doctor receives the surprise gift of an 11-year-old Chinese houseboy. Sent as a bequest from an old friend, young Ren has a mission. To find, his ma to find his dead master's severed finger and reunite it with his body. Ren has 49 days, or else his master's soul will roam the earth forever. Ji Lin, an apprentice dressmaker, moonlights as a dance hall girl to pay her mother's debts. One night, Ji Lin's dance partner leaves her with a gruesome souvenir that leads her on a crooked, dark trail. As time runs out for Ren's mission, a series of unexplained deaths occur amid rumours of a tiger's who turn into men. In their journey to keep a promise and discover the truth, Ren and Ji Lin's paths will cross in ways they never forget. 
so uh, I think Kayla talked about how beautiful the writing is and how it's kind of a weird historical fiction which is my favourite I love weird historical fictions and again I visited Malaysia in 2019 and it is a brilliant country and I feel like I really want to learn and understand more about the countries I visited um, because I really didn't know very much before I went um, and so I need to make that uh, an effort I need to make an effort to do that and so those are uh, 14 I think books that I'm interested in reading but that aren't brand new releases if you've never if you'd never heard of any of them before um, I hope you found something that you would be interested in reading as well thank you for watching please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe because I put out new videos every Wednesday Friday and Sunday and so I will see you again very very soon bye bye